we just love you and praise you and give you glory today. You are our God and King. And Father, we hate to see our friend go, but Lord, we know he's close at heart and he'll be back through these doors. And um, as we try to refocus our heart and our energy on your word, we know that Jesus, you are the sustainer of life. You are the one who connects us. You're the one who guides us. And Father, we just are honored to be in your presence today, and we ask you to fill this place with your Holy Spirit, Lord God. Turn our tears um, into joy, Lord Jesus. We just can't thank you enough. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Give God one more bit of glory today. God bless him. So if you're a guest today and we haven't met, my name's Eric. Thank you so much for coming out and worshiping with us. Uh, before you leave, be sure to stop by our Next Step station. We have a free gift that we'd love to give to you as our way of saying thank you for coming out and worshiping with us. Feel free to come on up. I'd love to meet you and welcome you and your family as well. And I just can't thank you enough for being here. We've come to the end of our 21-day season of prayer and fasting. Is anybody excited? Okay, well, here's the bad news. I real, really feel deeply called in my heart that God wants us to continue on this fast for seven more days. I'm teasing people. It's okay. You're going to be okay. You can go back and get back to your normal eating in Jesus' name. Amen. So during this season, we've been talking a lot about the fact that most of us are walking around with our batteries drained. We're just barely existing. Um, we are sometimes being recharged by the washing of God's word, but oftentimes we look to the things of this world to get recharged, and they leave us lacking, and they leave us in pain. So we entered into this season of emptying out and pouring out ourselves with the hope that by seeking God through prayer, through seeking God through fasting, that he would meet us in that place and that he would re-energize us and this wouldn't be the end. This would be the beginning of what he wants to do in our lives. And I pray that you met him in some secret places and some breakthroughs happened in your life. If they didn't, keep pressing in, keep persisting. God loves you dearly. And we're going to talk about that a bit today. I wanted to, when I was kicking off this series there, for some of you who are a little bit older, maybe a little bit into Southern rock from those days, like maybe my age up in here, and uh, there was a band called the Jackson Brown Band, and they had a song called Running on Empty. Does anybody remember that one? I dare not sing it. I dare not sing it, but it was like, running on empty. So, you don't get it, yeah? So it went over just like my team thought it would go over. They're like, Eric, you cannot play that song. I was like, can you get the band to come up and play it? They're like, nobody's going to know it. So I'll post it on Facebook because it was a glorious, wonderful song that you need to listen to. But it's lyric state, I don't know when that road turned into the road that I'm on, running on empty, running blind. And I think those lyrics spoke to that generation in the 70s, but it also speaks to us today. I mean, I think that's where we're at sometimes. We're running on empty. We're just barely getting by. And then all of a sudden, we find ourselves down these roads and we're like, how in the world did I get to the place where I find myself today? And it's hard to figure out our way back, but God gives us a path back. And there's story after story in the Bible that we're not alone in this. Does anybody remember this story called Exodus? That was supposed to be a very short one from the place that they were in bondage and needing to be set free. They get set free and they would have had but a short journey to the promised land, the place where God wanted them to go, but they were running on empty. They were looking in all these different kinds of directions. There was all these detours. They started worshiping a golden calf and all this craziness ensued and the journey ended up taking them 40 years when it probably should have taken them 40 days. Do any of you feel like you're there right now? Amen. Maybe you feel like you're in that place. If so, this message is for you. And might this message series that we've been through be that place of refilling in your heart and in your spirit, giving you that tune-up, giving you that oil change that you needed so that you're ready for the season that is to come. Now we need to be in that daily maintenance mode, right? 
We need to be putting into practice the things that we've been learning on a daily basis so we don't get to that place where our candles are burnt at both ends and they burn out, right? Where our engine runs out on empty or we run out of oil, we need to keep coming after God. So what you're going to find is next week, I'm going to continue talking about prayer and we're going to get into a deep topic of intercession, of binding and loosing and taking authority in the spirit realm because our journey is not over just because the season of concentrated prayer and fasting is ended. It goes on for a lifetime and there's so much more that we need to learn. So I pray you'll come back for a Super Bowl for your soul. The Super Bowl ain't taking place till like seven or eight o'clock at night. You got plenty of time to for church in the morning. Come on, Jesus. I hope to see you here next week. So let's examine this story and some of the elements of it for a moment. Those of you who know this story of the journey from Exodus, you know, they have this time in the wilderness and God's actually providing for them as he does for you and I. He wants to be there in them and among them and with them. He has their daily needs met for, but then guess what? Just like us, did any of you ever complain along the way, even though God's taking care of everything? Some of y'all do. Shake your head. Yeah, like, yeah, that's you. That's me. Yeah. I do it too. We all do that. But God gives them this guide. And don't you know, he gives us one too? A couple weeks from now, we're going to talk about walking in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. See, he gave them everything they needed. It was there along with them. And God gives us everything we need as well if we will only tap into the source of true energy, the source of true power, none other than the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. So how would God lead them? It says in Exodus 13, 21, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. So as I said last week, when we talked about the garden with Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve having this opportunity to walk and talk and hang out with God himself, God's desire has always been to be with his people. He wants to be with us. He wants to be in communion with us. He wants to have that level of fellowship and intimacy with us. And he's waiting there to do it. It's us that's the hindrance in it. The sin in our lives, the misdirection, the distractions, all of these things are what hinder that relationship. But if you'll notice, God was there with them the whole way, illuminating the path for them. He was in the middle of the congregation of the Israelites. They would follow alongside and around wherever this ark in the wilderness would go or this tabernacle of the, wil- tabernacle of the wilderness would go. So he wants to be with you too. You might say, Eric, but you don't know the stuff I've done or where I've been. You're right, I don't, but God does. And guess what? He still loves you and he still wants to be with you. He did not forsake them. He was with them the entire time. And do you know that in the New Testament, it says the same thing. If you look at the Great Commission and behold, I am with you always and even to the end of the age. In Hebrews chapter 13 and Deuteronomy chapter 31 uh, verse 6 in the Old Testament, it says, he will never leave you or forsake you. you. He will never leave you or forsake you. He's there with you in the dark places. Now, he don't want to go there. But he does because he loves you. He doesn't want to stay there with you. He wants to pull you out of darkness and ignite that fire of light in your heart. Romans 8.38 really brings the point home. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I haven't convinced you already, he wants to be with you. He wants to be near you. He wants to walk and talk with you on a daily basis. He loves you dearly. Be in communion with him. Spend time with him and watch how your life changes. At that time, God chose to contain himself in what was called the tabernacle of the wilderness or the tabernacle of Moses. 
Later, they would end up in Jerusalem and two temples would be built to proclaim and hold the glory of God here on earth. Both of those temples have since been destroyed and scripture tells us that one day soon, a third temple will be rebuilt and in that temple, the false Messiah will come and lay his feet down and declare himself to be God. But guess what? Jesus is gonna come and defeat him. Isn't that good news, right? So it's coming again in the future. But he contains himself there. Exodus 25, 8 says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell in their midst. So many of you, you could go look it up. There's pictures of what the tabernacle might have looked like, but it was a tent. It was mobile. It was the first portable church set up. They were going from place to place while they were out there in the wilderness, right? So Unfortunately and sadly, not everybody could go inside of the tabernacle. It was restricted to priests and only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. The people were still separated from God. There needed to be a sacrifice made so the priest would stand as an intermediary between God and man. A sacrifice would be made. They would make that person's request known by going into an area called the Holy of Holies. And then man really didn't have direct access to God. And in fact, we don't to a degree today unless you have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Savior, which gives us direct access to God the Father, which we'll talk about in a minute. But in this tabernacle, there were actually seven objects that we might use as a bit of a framework for our prayers. Remember, we've been talking about how can you build your prayer life? How can you build your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding about how to approach the Lord in prayer, right? So we talked about the Lord's Prayer from the New Testament last week and the week before. Today, maybe here's another way that you can approach the throne room of God when you come to him in prayer. So we're going to go venture into a place that no or very few human beings could ever get in that day. We're going to examine some of the things that they would experience when they began to walk into that tent. It's important to note that the tabernacle was a temp tent-like structure that was meticulously built I mean, God gave them meticulous instructions. It was wonderfully made. And guess what? You are fearfully and wonderfully made just like that tabernacle. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So these analogies we're giving have place in our own lives today. What was the first thing that they would encounter? They would encounter the altar of sacrifice. It was a bronze altar of sacrifice. Bronze speaks of sin, and there was a perpetual fire that was lifted up from there. The altar symbolizes God's judgment against sin. So worshipers would hand off their offering to the priest who would go offer it on their behalf. We know from scripture that there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of what? Blood. Blood. So some of y'all know this kind of stuff. Amen. As believers, we realize that Jesus also died on an altar. It was called the cross. He died that our sins were forgiven or would be forgiven, that our pains might go away. And today, when we get ready to close, we're all going to take communion together as a great way of officially breaking that um, fast that we've been on. So sin cannot enter into God's presence. That's the first thing you need to understand, right? So there needs to be a sacrifice. So they go and they make this sacrifice. Now they could begin to venture in just a little bit deeper into this place. And the next thing that they would encounter is a bronze water basin, a basin that was filled with water. Bronze, again, represents sin. Water represents the washing of the Holy Spirit, right? The washing and cleansing of our lives. In our day and age, the blood of Jesus Christ makes you white as snow. The once and for all sacrifice for your sins, past, present, and future, right? Do you get that one? That's an important distinction there, right? Guess what? God knows you're going to sin probably before the end of this message, right? God knows that you are going to sin, yet he still loves you. And if you are covered by the blood of Jesus, your sins are washed away. You are now white as snow. 
Isaiah 1, 18 puts it this way. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall now be white as snow. Thank you, Jesus. So they enter into that first room, and then there's kind of this division of rooms. They open the tent to get into the first room, and there's another tent that they would begin to approach. But in this holy place, which is what the next section is termed, there's three different objects that are within that holy place. So if you start to think of this as a prayer, like we did with the other one, you walk in, Lord, thank you for your sacrifice that makes me white as snow. Thank you for allowing me by the sacrifice that Jesus made to begin to head towards the holy of holies, to begin to go to that place where I can meet you face to face, where my prayers can be answered, but also that place where I can hear from you. Do you see how this is building where God is wanting to take us. In this place, you would find the lampstand, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. They are all now no longer made of bronze. They are made of gold, representing the purity and deity of our God. The holy place is filled with symbolism about Jesus Christ, right? The golden lampstand speaks of the one revealed to us by the Father, the one who is the light of of the world whose flame will never burn out. Jesus is the light of the world. And then what does it say in other scripture? Jesus is the bread of life, the one in whom we find our sustenance. God set all these things up beautifully and perfectly throughout the ages if he would only give us eyes to see this very day. The altar of incense, the prayers of the saints going up to the nostrils of the Father as an act of worship, continual worship unto our God and King. Aren't you glad? 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ, who's praying and interceding for you and I all of the time. The next object they begin to approach is actually this veil that separates the holy place from the holy of holies. So as we continue on in these thoughts of prayers, Lord, thank you for the sacrifice that you made. Thank you that you washed me by your blood and my sins are as far as the east is from the west. Lord, as I enter into this holy place, I remember that Jesus, you are the light of the world. And I remember those verses where you turned it around and said, now you go, you are the light of the world that you want me to go out there and represent your light, but I can't do so if I'm running on empty. Your word says that you are the bread of life. Thank you so much for providing for me, oh God. Thank you for sustaining me. Thank you for fulfilling me with your word that I can share with others with the hope that they too would come to know you. Thank you, Lord. And all of those prayers that you offer up are that incense going up to the throne room of heaven. Amen. Now, no priest or no normal person could ever get by there, and the priest better be careful too. There's stories of them wrapping a rope around the priest's leg that if the priest didn't go in there under the right conditions, he would drop dead as he enters into the next room, right? So no human being could go there. But in Christ, do you know what he says about you? You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people set apart unto God, which means that because of your relationship with Jesus, because of the covering of his blood, you and I could go into the holy of holies. Do you get that for a second? This most holy place where if you go in there with any sin in your life, you would drop dead in an instant. When Jesus died on a cross, it says the temple veil was rent in two not by way of man where they would have grabbed it from the bottom or began to cut it from the bottom to the top. It was ripped by God himself from the top to the bottom, opening up access, direct access to God the Father for you and I by the blood of Jesus Christ that was spilled that day on Calvary's cross so that you and I could, as scripture says, come boldly into the throne room of grace, offering up our prayers, offering up our praise, offering up our worship, offering up our requests. This is an amazing thing. God wants to be with you. He wants you to be in his presence. But to do so, our sins need to be washed away. They need to be as far as the east is from the west, right? 
Man, would we meditate on these things as we end this season of prayer and fasting. Communion is a New Testament way of representing a lot of these things. So I really felt in my heart as we were coming to the end of this that the right way to conclude this season was to do so in worship, in prayer, and taking up of the communion elements and receiving those and contemplating those for a few minutes because, man, it brings all the stuff that we've been talking about together into a head. Man, if you feel distant from God today, do you know that as a believer in Jesus Christ, you don't have to feel worthy, you are worthy. You are worthy to come into the throne room of God boldly, it says in scripture. So I'll do an all-encompassing wrapping up prayer at the end where I go from the first object to the seventh object. But when you get in there would be that final ark of the covenant that we saw in Raiders of the Lost Ark that would contain the Ten Commandments. And God had that place where his presence would dwell in the midst of the Holy of Holies, right? And there's a mercy seat in there where we find mercy from our God and King, right? But the beauty of all this is God no longer wants to dwell in a temple made by human hands. Amen. He wants to dwell by the power of the Holy Spirit in your heart and in mine. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit and we should treat it as holy. We should treat it as set apart. We should treat it as important as it really is. That's why it's so important that we live holy lives. Do you know or remember the story where they're carrying the ark and if you just even touched it, the dude tripped? I feel pretty bad for the dude. I mean, he tripped and kind of went right into it and he ends up dying. It was that holy, no sin can touch that. But God gives us this opportunity by the blood of Jesus Christ to come boldly into his presence. So if there's sin in your life today, you need to renounce it during this time of communion. You need to lay it down. You need to say, Lord, help me. My request as I enter into the Holy of Holies is, Lord, help me with this stuff in my life that I can't get over on my own. I am emptied out that you might fill me up, that I could live for you, that I could stay in your presence. And your presence is fullness of joy. In your presence is fullness of joy. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? Worship team, would you come to the front? I had so much more I wanted to share. We got second service. You have to come back for more. Second service, we could linger a little longer. Come on, Jesus. Except kids' church wants to kill us. Be sure to see them after the service and Lord's tugging at your heart in that, please go out there with them. So please bow your head and close your eyes for a second. Begin to prepare your hearts for communion. Communion is something believers do. It's an acknowledgement that, and also a commandment that Jesus said, as often as you gather together, do this. That's why we offer it up here every single week. We don't always take it corporately together, but you have an opportunity every week to remind yourself of Jesus' sacrifice in your place for your sins that you might have eternal life, right? So today we're gonna to do it as a faith family together all at one time. But if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, this is not something you should do. I mean, it's for people who believe. It says it's something that's sacred. It's something that you should not take lightly. There's nothing wrong with that. If you're still exploring your faith, you're welcome to hang out here. We're not gonna do anything weird. Continue to enjoy the atmosphere. Continue to contemplate your faith. And if you're enjoying this and you're sensing God's presence and he's touching you, today's the day that you should make Jesus the Lord of your life. You know, this is an opportunity when you come up here to the front, myself and other people will be up here, say, man, I wanna surrender my life to God. If you wanna surrender your life to Jesus, man, we would love to share that life moment with you. We would love to give you some tips and some help and starting off your walk of faith in a great way. So please do that for the rest of us. Take these next couple moments, get in line, come up here and grab the elements, hold on to them, and then we'll all partake together in just a moment. But stay in an atmosphere of worship, stay in an atmosphere of praise, let the Holy Spirit work in your heart and in your mind. Please do that right now. Begin to come to the front and get the communion elements. Let's worship our Lord and King. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, 
I believe that you are my fortune Oh, and you are my portion You are my hiding place Oh, I believe you are The way, the truth, the life Yeah, I believe you are The way, yes, you are the truth, the life, mm-hmm. I believe through every blessing, through every promise, through every prayer I take, I believe that you are provided, oh, and you are protected, you are the one I love, oh. Passover story, right? Jesus, or God says to them that an angel of death was going to come and slay all of them and that they need to be ready and that if they would sacrifice a lamb for a house and they would put the blood on the doorposts and lentils of their house, then the angel of death would pass over them, that they should prepare their food in haste, that 
Um, they would prepare the matzah in haste. It's unleavened bread without sin. So we use that same thing here. And what they didn't know that day is even the very bread that they were using would be very representative of who Jesus is and the sacrifice that he would one day later make once and for all time for all who would believe. So as you prepare your hearts for communion today, I guess one of the first things I would say is today's also Holocaust Remembrance Day. And, um, you know, we stand with the Jewish people and the six million plus that died in that gruesome time in human history. Um, we stand with them this morning. Those same people that left Egypt and went towards Israel, you know, suffered great tragedy all throughout their lives, but they still depend on their God and King. So they that day prepared that sacrifice that uh, is depicted by this bread. So if you hold it up for just a moment, it's uh, unleavened bread. It represents that sinlessness that Jesus is the bread of life, right? We read about that. Jesus is the bread of life. And Isaiah, that same prophet we read of earlier, says that he would be pierced for our transgressions. There's piercings in there. A true Passover matzah would have 39 piercings for the 39 lashes that Jesus would one day take, right? It says he was bruised. See those little brown marks? He was bruised for our iniquities. His body broken that we might have life, right? Lord, we bow our heads and close our eyes and lift up this bread in remembrance of you. As we break this season of prayer and fasting with this bread, we remember the great sacrifice that you made. Many of us have been standing just outside the tabernacle of the wilderness. We've been hanging out in the outer courts for all too long. May today be that day that we, as part of that royal priesthood, open up that tent for the first time and walk in and glance at that bronze altar where you made that sacrifice for your word says that you are the lamb of God who was sacrificed to take away the sins of all mankind. It is your blood that washes us that we'll partake in just a moment in that first room. That blood that washes us pure as snow. So we lift up this bread in remembrance of what you did for us. Your body was pierced. Your body was bruised by your stripes. We are healed and we partake of it right now in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Just of the, as the blood of the lamb was placed on the doorposts and lentils of those houses, Lord, the blood of your son is placed on the doorposts and lentils of our hearts, making us white as snow. We are washed with the water and washing of your word. So, Father, we lift up this cup to you, remembering that great sacrifice that your son made. And as we still sit in that first room, not ready yet to go into the holy place or the holy of holies. Maybe just hold on to it for a little bit longer. We're white as snow and we venture into that next room, incense flooding up the heaven, the prayers of the saints. We see that lampstand, Jesus, you are the light of the world. That showbread, you are the bread of life. And envision Jesus that day on that cross, dying, the temple veil being rent in two, and you're standing in the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus Christ, ready to make your request known to God, ready to hear from our Lord and King. Lord, as we contemplate our own sin at this moment, we lift those things up to you and we lay it at your feet. And before we partake of this cup, Maybe make some of your requests known to God. What breakthrough are you believing for? What have you been praying for during the course of this season? Lord, would you seal it right now on that brazen altar? We thank you for the mercy seat. We thank you that your spirit and your presence dwells within our hearts, and we are now that tabernacle in our wilderness, ready to go out in the world and make a difference for you. So we lift up this cup in remembrance of the great sacrifice that you made in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here with someone you know, give them a big hug. If you don't know them, handshake might suffice. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming out and worshiping with us today.